Well, good morning, everybody. It is, it is great to be back with you. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 10. We'll be starting in verse 25. And this morning, if you don't know, this is the start of a new series. We, we stopped in the Gospel of Mark about halfway through. We're going to pick up again there uh, in, the, in January, which seems like a long way away, but we have a lot of really fun stuff to work through till then. But today is the start of a series we're calling The Values of a Gospel People, where we're going to be taking a deep dive into the mission and the values of Oak Mountain Presbyterian Church. And, and if you are new with us, or even if you've been with us for forever, you, you should know this. The mission of this church, it's to engage every neighbor with the surprising power of grace. You know, we, we have made a change in leadership in these past six months, but that mission hasn't changed. Uh, it is behind every single thing that we do, and the reason that mission hasn't changed is because that's not Oak Mountain's mission, that's Jesus's. And in the end, this is Jesus's church. Our job is simply to follow where he would lead. We see this all through the scriptures, but maybe nowhere more clearly than the text we're looking at today. Would you stand with me as we read this story from Luke 10, starting in verse 25? And behold... A lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, Rabbi, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But the man, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when you come back, when I come back. Which of these three do you think? Prove to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers. The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father, we just sang a few moments ago that our sins, they are many, but your mercy is more. And we pray, Lord, as only you can, through your Spirit, would you show us that dual reality? Would you show us our sin in the ways that it exists in us that are deeper than we even know, but at the same time, Lord, would we see in you one who is better than we could even imagine, who meets us in our deepest places of need and empowers us as his ambassadors to go out with this very gospel that has saved us. Would you do this in Christ's name? Amen. You can take your seats. A couple weeks ago, uh, I had stumbled across the news that there was going to be a, a new bio, a biographic movie about Flannery O'Connor, who's one of my favorite writers. And so I started digging back in to some of her old short stories. And if you've ever read Flannery O'Connor, her short stories, they are super, super weird. Uh, they all take a dark turn at some point. And there was one called Revelation that I had read before. I'd been struck by it before, but it struck me differently this time. It's this story 
of a woman named Mrs. Turpin who takes a trip to the doctor's office and has to sit in a waiting room. And she enters into this room and she is looking at all the people within the office. On the one side of the room, she sees this family that in her eyes is unwashed and rude and impolite. A family that she looks at and thinks, these must be what I call white trash. And then on the other side of the room, she sees a woman that she imagines is kind of like herself, polite and respectable and dignified. And sitting next to this woman is a college-age girl that in Mrs. Turpin's eyes is ugly and overweight. And Mrs. Turpin sits there in the room and she makes polite conversation, but in her head she's saying, thank you, Jesus, that you have not made me like these people. Thank you that you've not made me like the trash, white or black. Thank you that you have, well, you haven't made me a beauty queen. You haven't made me fat or overweight or ugly like this girl. Thank you that you made me dignified and respectful. Thank you that you made me kind to everyone. And all the while that she is eyeing this room, the college-age girl is eyeing her with a look of dislike on her face that Mrs. Turpin really doesn't like. And then all of a sudden, the girl takes the book that enters in her hand, and she hits Mrs. Turpin across the face with it, leaps across her chair, and begins to choke her around the throat, and whispers in her ear with all the hate she can muster, go back to hell where you came from, you old warthog. And they rip the girl off of Mrs. Turpin. But Mrs. Turpin, in that moment when she gets up, everything in her world has just been undone. She stumbles out of the room in a daze, and she begins to ask everyone that she runs into to ask them if she is really a warthog from hell. And she tells them the story, and every single person goes, oh no, you are so kind to everyone, so polite and so good. But nothing, nothing they say, nothing seems to assuage your conscience. And so she goes off by herself and she is looking over the pigs in her farm and as she's watching them, she begins to scream at God in her heart. How dare you? How dare you have something like that happen to me? I'm not like those other people. I go to church every Sunday. I do the right things. I pay my tithes. I'm kind to everyone. How dare you do that to me? And she looks off into the distance, and all of a sudden she has a vision. There is a highway leading up to heaven and the glory of God is at the end and millions of people are making their way towards that heavenly glory and in the very front, there are people laughing and dancing and rejoicing, clothed in white garments and she realizes it is the unwashed masses that she despised. It's the trash. It's the freaks. It's the ugly It's the lunatics, radiant with the glory of God. And in the very back, miles and miles behind, she sees people like her, dignified but joyless, clothed not in white robes, but in their supposed virtues. And she watches in horror as all those virtues, they are burned away by the fire of God's grace. She's undone. The mask that she has been wearing, the mask she didn't even realize she had on, it's been ripped away. Luke 10 is Jesus doing the same thing. He is confronting us with a grace that confounds and surprises because it forces us to confront who we really are. But at the very same time, it extends to us a grace beyond anything that we could even begin to comprehend. And just as Flannery O'Connor's story does, it demands we ask this question, in the face of such grace, how are we going to respond? And it starts with this surprising encounter with a lawyer, an expert in the Jewish law. He shows up to talk to Jesus, a man who is as full of pride as Mrs. Turpin is, and he comes with this question. Verse 25, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? It's a good question. 
I mean, it's the kind of question that he should be asking. It's the question of the crowd in Acts 2. Peter preaches, they're cut to the heart, and they say to Peter, what must we do? It's a great question. The trouble is he's asking with the wrong motive. Why is the lawyer there in front of Jesus? It says he stood up. Why? To put him to the test. This is a moment 10 chapters in the making. Everywhere Jesus has gone in his ministry, he has been defying all the expectations that the religious leaders had about who the kingdom of God is supposed to be for. In their minds, the kingdom of God, the blessings of God, the favor of God, the love of God, it was supposed to be for people who were born in the right place, to the right kind of families, who followed the right rules and lived the right kind of lives. And that kingdom, it was not for those who didn't. And Jesus, Jesus shows up. And what is Jesus doing? He is showing the kindness and the mercy and the love of God to all the people who look like opposite. He's eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners. He's welcoming them into his inner circle as beloved friends. And while he's embracing the sinners, he's critiquing the religious leaders. And with each step, it is becoming clearer and clearer that their definition of who is in the kingdom and Jesus' definition of who is in the kingdom, they are radically different things. And so the lawyer The lawyer has come to expose Jesus as the fraud that he thinks he is. He wants to put him on trial and show him to be guilty so they can dismiss him once and for all. And Jesus Jesus does that thing he always does in these moments. He just flips the table so that suddenly it's not Jesus who's on trial, it's the lawyer He answers the question with a question. He says, what is written in the law? Verse 26. How do you read it? Literally, what do you see in the scripture and how do you interpret it? And the lawyer's answer, I mean, it's perfect. If this was a test and someone was grading his paper, he gives you the most pristine answer that you could imagine. It's the exact same one Jesus would give. He quotes the two commands that undergird all the law and all the prophets. First, he says, you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength, Deuteronomy 6.5. And then he quotes Leviticus 19.18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He knows what Jesus does. Those two commands, love God and love neighbor, they are so inextricably intertwined that to break one is to break them both. Because how can you love the God that you have not seen if you have not loved the person, the neighbor that you have seen, as 1 John 4.20 says? He knows it. And Jesus hears his answer and he says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. And this is where the trouble starts. Because who... Who can hear those commands and say that we have done either one? It's one thing to know the law. It's another to actually obey it, isn't it? I mean, if you were to look at your own life under those standards, even just one of them, the neighbor is yourself, how many of us could raise our hand and say, you know what, I think I've done that well. I couldn't. And the lawyer, the lawyer knows that he can't either. And so he does that thing that we all do when somebody points out something in our life that we don't want to admit. He starts trying to justify himself. He turns to Jesus in verse 29 and he says, And who is my neighbor? You know, this... This question is one that was heavily debated amongst the Jews of this era. That They were looking at that law in Leviticus 19, and they were thinking what most of us are probably thinking. Surely this can't mean everybody. 
And they all debated about what the exact parameters of neighbor were supposed to be. But here was the general consensus. Your neighbor was your fellow Israelite. But it was not the sinner. It was not the immigrant. It was not the foreigner. And it most certainly was not that people over there in Samaria that we call Samaritans. They were on the outside. And while you were supposed to love your neighbor and care for them in their time of need, as God commands in the Old Testament and in the New. You're the others, the ones who didn't fit into that category. You could hate them. You see Jesus literally reflecting back this belief to a crowd in Matthew 5. Jesus is preaching this sermon, a very famous sermon, one called the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, you have heard that it was said, Matthew 5, verse 43, meaning this isn't in the scriptures, but this is what your religious leaders are teaching you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor. That's Leviticus 19. And then they had added this piece, and you can hate your enemy. The lawyer, he has been building his identity and his sense of self on a limited law like that. He thinks that he is one who has inherited eternal life because he's taken the law and he has stripped it down so that he thinks he can actually keep it. And he has made a category, there is neighbor over here and enemy over there, and only one of these am I required to love. And before we judge him too harshly, it's not that foreign of an impulse, is it? I mean, I read an article this week from a professing Christian who was making the case that while Jesus says we're supposed to love our enemies, that only applies to our personal enemies. And that we can actually classify people as friends or enemies based on the degree to which they oppose our particular worldview. And if they are in that enemy category then we no longer have to operate with the same moral standards Jesus calls us to everywhere else. We can lie, we can cheat, and we can steal to get our way because they are enemies of the kingdom of God. And the line that he used throughout this thing, you probably guessed what it is. It's politics. Who is my neighbor? Not people like that. We do this all the time. We say our neighbor is the one who can help my career. It's not the one who hurts it. My neighbor is the one who applauds me. It's not, it's not the one who criticizes me. And let me bring it even closer to home. Who here has ever had a fight with your spouse? Which has never happened in my house, by the way. And you find yourself saying and doing things you know are wrong. But in your head, and sometimes out loud, you're saying, I'm justified because of something they've said or done to me. Do you realize what we're doing in that moment? We're saying, my neighbor, it's the person who treats me the way I want to be treated. And as soon as someone does not, they may still be my spouse, but they are my neighbor no more. I can treat them how I want. There's people like me, and then there's people like them. Jesus in Luke 10, he's just blowing that all to heck. He's saying, as soon as you ask that question, who is my neighbor, you've already failed the test. Your heart has already been exposed you are not the one who has done this and thus will live. You are the one who has not done this and thus lives under the sentence of death. And he does it through this surprising story. This is one of the most famous parables that Jesus ever tells. And it starts with this nameless, faceless, anonymous man. We don't know if he's a Jew or if he's a Gentile. Uh, we don't know if he's a saint or if he's a sinner, which means all those things the lawyer would use to say whether he was his neighbor or not, none of them are here. 
He is totally anonymous in every way. All you know is this. He has gone from Jerusalem down to the city of Jericho, and as he is traveling, a group of robbers have jumped him. They have stripped him of his clothes. They've beaten him to within an inch of his life, and they have left him for dead, which means in the text there is this implicit question, who will care for this man in his time of need? Who will provide for him what God would ask of them? Who's going to help this man and preserve his life? And all of a sudden, two men show up. First a priest and then a Levite. Both the kind of men that the lawyer would look at and say, if anyone is in the kingdom, it's these guys. They work in the temple. They take part in the sacrifices. They pray the prayers for God's people. They are ritually pure. And yet what happens? They see the man. The text is clear as day. They do not miss this man's body on the side of the road. And what happens in both occasions? They pass by on the other side. They get as far away from this man as they possibly can, and they keep right on moving. And here's the thing. They may have had legitimate reasons for doing so. I mean, maybe they're thinking that if they stop, the robbers are going to jump not just the man, but them too. And there's not just going to be one body on the side of the road, there's going to be two. Maybe they're worried about becoming ritually impure. I mean, their jobs are working in the temple, and that means they can't do their jobs. And so maybe they're concerned about that impurity because this could be a dead body. Maybe they have a dying loved one at home, and they've got to hurry back, and they're afraid if they stop, they're going to miss that moment. I mean, we don't know because Jesus doesn't tell us. And why doesn't Jesus tell us? Because Jesus doesn't care. It has nothing to do with the motive. Jesus' point is just this. It's that they saw the man in need and they did nothing. They left. But then in verse 33, there's a third man. The kind of man that the lawyer would look at and think, this man is more likely to rob someone than he is to help them. A Samaritan shows now, people have tried for years to find a good analog in the modern world to what it would be like to hear this part of the story. I mean, I've, I've heard people compare uh, it to a Nazi walking up the side of the road, and there's maybe something to that. It's, it's the idea of the, whatever the most offensive thing you could imagine, depending on your particular point of view. It could be, in your mind, the Antifa person, or it could be the person in the MAGA hat. I don't know. Whatever offends you, that's what's coming down the road. But even that... Even that doesn't come close to what it would have felt like for a Jew at that era to hear these words because Samaritans were not just any other people. They were seen by the Jews as these sort of ethnic half-breeds. They were the remnants of the Jews who had been left behind after the Assyrian invasion who had then married with the Gentiles that the Assyrians had brought to live in their land. And not only had these people intermarried, but they had begun to mix their faiths to the degree that the Samaritans, while they claimed to worship the God of Israel, they had a religion all their own. They had their own temple, their own rules, their own canon of scripture. They had their own set of beliefs. And the Jews, they hated the Samaritans, and the Samaritans, they hated the Jews because each one looked at the other and said, you are heretics. That's who's coming down the road. And yet, what does the Samaritan do? It says he sees the man, verse 33, and what does he have? Compassion. That's a significant word in the Gospel of Luke because there's only one other figure that is ever spoken of as having compassion. It's Jesus. God in human flesh. The only person in the story who is mirroring the heart of God in the midst of the world is the one who in the eyes of the religious leader, the lawyer, 
is as far from the heart of God as you could possibly be. And what does the Samaritan do next? He moves with everything he has to care for this man and his need. The text, it just slows way down, doesn't it? I mean, look at what it says, starting in verse 35. Or excuse me, in verse 34. He went up to and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, which would be enough for about three and a half weeks in an inn. And gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when you come back. The mercy that is supposed to be embodied by the people of God finds its expression in the life of the man you would least expect who sacrificially, generously, with no expectation of return, risks even his life for the sake of this anonymous man. Now, if you were the lawyer, this is where you start to feel a little bit of internal panic. It's like getting in a bar fight and realizing you've accidentally punched young Mike Tyson. Like Jesus is just systematically destroying the underpinnings of his world. He's placed limits on the law so that he can keep the law. And Jesus goes, no, 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 I don't think you get it. There's no limits here. Love of neighbor includes love of enemy. And the kind of love that you are to show, it is sacrificial, overwhelming, generous love that knows no bounds and expects nothing in return. It is love you are to give, grace you are to pour out, even to someone who hates you, even if they continue to do so. And right here, right here is where things begin to get difficult. Because what is Jesus doing? He's reframing the question. He's saying the question's not, who is my neighbor? It's, will I be a neighbor? He says in verse 36, Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And the lawyer, not wanting to even say the word Samaritan, the lawyer says, the one who showed him mercy. He knows as he says those words that despite all of his efforts and everything he has previously believed, he is not the one who is justified. He's lost. Because why does he... And why do the religious leaders hate Jesus? Because Jesus keeps showing mercy and grace like that. He is opposed to the one who is reflecting the heart of God. And then Jesus takes the knife and twists it deeper. You go and do likewise. Now, if Jesus stopped there... If that was all we were left with was here is the fullness of this law, now go and keep it. I mean, we're crushed, aren't we? We need a grace that is as extravagant as that of the Samaritans to the dead man if we are ever going to keep what Christ calls us to here. And that's the beauty of this story is that it ends with a surprising grace. You know, this lawyer, he's undone. He is unmasked in the same way Mrs. Turpin was. He is revealed for all to see, but the degree of unmasking, it's actually only started. This parable, in many ways, is kind of like a time bomb. It it doesn't show its full effect until far later on down the road. And Jesus, when he's telling the story, he, he knows it. And there is a hint of what is coming in verse 28. That phrase that Jesus uses that makes the lawyers think that he needs to start justifying himself. What is it in verse 28? You do this and you will live. Now, if you're conversant with the Old Testament, which this lawyer most certainly is, 
you know there's only one place in the entirety of the Old Testament that has the exact same grammatical construction as that phrase. Do you know where it is? Genesis 42. And who is speaking? Joseph. And what, who is Joseph speaking to? His brothers. The men who just a few chapters before stripped him of his clothes, robbed him of his inheritance, and by selling him into slavery, left him for dead. It's the victimized speaking to the victimizers, the innocent speaking to the guilty, which is significant because that's what Jesus is doing again. Because Jesus knows what the religious leaders are going to do, doesn't he? What do we see in the religious leaders in the chapters that follow this? You start noticing this very significant word show up over and over again. Luke 19, verse 46. Jesus tells them that they've been turning the house of prayer, the temple, into a den of what? Robbers. Luke 22 Jesus is preparing for his death. He is in the garden praying to the Lord and the chief priests and the elders. They come crashing through the undergrowth there to arrest him, there to put him to death. And Jesus' response is, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, when I was in Jerusalem, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. What are they doing? They are treating Jesus the way they treated the robbers, or the way the robbers treated the man. And at just how much that is going to happen, it becomes even plainer afterwards because what do they do? They strip him of his clothes, they beat him to within an inch of his life, and they crucify him on the cross. You know, if. If there is an unmasking happening here, I mean, these men, they are as much warthogs from hell as Mrs. Turpin ever was. In fact, they're worse because who are they killing as the robbers? It's not even the anonymous man. It's the good Samaritan. God in human flesh come to save. They are falling upon him and taking his life because they want what rightfully belongs only to him. And at the same time Jesus is unveiling them, he's unveiling us too, isn't he? Because as soon as in our hearts we have said, who is my neighbor? We have revealed that the same heart that opposed God's will in Christ that same heart of mercy, that is a heart that we have opposed as well. But here is the beauty of this text. It is revealing us in ways that make us profoundly uncomfortable. But it is also revealing the heart of Christ in a way that should fill us with joy. Because why is Christ on the cross? Why is he stripped and beaten and crucified? Because he wanted it to happen. For the sake of the very robbers who would take his life. He knew that we couldn't justify ourselves. He knew that we were all condemned under that law. He knew that on our own we had no power and we had no strength, that our hearts were enslaved to sin, and he knew the only way that we could be justified would be in the life of another. And so who did Jesus come to be? He came to be both the just and the justifier the one who lived that life that we were called to live but never could, who did it with every breath, every thought, every beat of his heart, and at the same time, the one who died the death that we deserved so that we would never have to fear that death again. And he does so so he could present us before the Father as those who were holy and blameless and above reproach, providing for us in abundance even as the good Samaritan provided for the, the almost dead man. He has shown us grace upon grace upon grace, and He has given us His Spirit. Why? So that we would no longer live as those who are opposed to His will, but as those who are swept along by it. 
who are pointing others to the grace that has claimed us and showing them that grace as well. I read last week an article in the Times about an Israeli doctor who 20 years ago uh, saved the life of a patient. And that doesn't sound like anything that remarkable, except for the fact that this patient, he had been a prisoner of the Israeli government. And he was a prisoner because he was a Hamas terrorist who had confessed to the murder through a bombing of dozens of innocent people. And he had been captured and he had been imprisoned for that act. But when that patient showed up in medical crisis in the office of this doctor, he knew that he had to care for him in the same way he cared for anyone else. And so even though here was a man who hated him, a man who would kill his family if given the chance, he thought, I have to save this man. I have to to do whatever I can. And so he tried to save his life and he succeeded. But here's where the story takes a turn. 20 years later, on October the 7th, When Hamas came pouring over the border and killed hundreds of innocent men, women, and children, including that doctor's nephew, do you know who planned that attack? That prisoner. And the end of the article, it was a bereaved Israeli woman, grieving and angry, looking at this doctor and saying, why, oh, why did you save him? I don't know what his answer would be. But I can tell you what our answer should be. It's because that is what Jesus has done for us. He loved us when we were his enemies. And he loved us enough to give his own life. And he has given us of his very spirit that we would not only receive that grace as a gift in the same way the man received the care of the good Samaritan, giving nothing in return, but receiving it simply as a gift, that we would then go and extend that to others as well. Not just to some neighbors, but to all. You go and do likewise. As Augustine said at the end of one of his homilies, what is love's perfection? To love our enemies and to love them to the end that they may be our brothers. Love your enemies, desiring them for brothers. Love your enemies, calling them into your fellowship. For so loved he who as he hung upon the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Amen. Gracious Father, we are so thankful to have a God who pursues us down into the depths, a God who shows us such grace and such kindness, a God who lays us bare, but Lord, not to put us to shame, but Lord, instead to bring us to life. And we pray, Lord, as as those who've received such a grace, would you turn us into people who continuously show that grace to all that we see in their place of need with no expectation of return. Would you do this in Christ's name? Amen.